Ishwaramba's resplendent sun. It's the start of a bright new day. Time to rise, time to shine, Lord Divine. Time to lead us along life's way. Awake, Lord of Buddha Party. Spiritually speaking, number seven has great mystical significance and spiritual phenomenon, particularly those connected with an avatar or an incarnation of the divine or the divinity taking a human form is marked by sevenfold spiritual powers, basically speaking. Seven so therefore, the 70th birthday of Bhagavan Baba, who is the modern, you might call, the, inca the divine incarnation of the age, reaches a certain point when there is fulfillment of all these seven types or seven filled activities, characteristics, powers, glories, what we call vibhutis and mahimas. <coughs> the first part of Bhagavan Baba's life, that is his early childhood time, is marked by childhood sportive activities, leelas, as we call it. <coughs> As Baba had explained, the second part <coughs> of his life would be devoted to and has been, very rightly so, has happened to enlightenment through teachings. And the third part of his life is a continuation of both Leela's and teachings and service activities. <coughs> and it is in the fourth part of his life, after all he had said that he would live till his 96th year and which would be somewhere around 2022. The fourth part of his life would be a culmination and a fulfillment of all these aspects. In addition to catering to the individual needs, requirements of spiritual knowledge, of spiritual elevation to his devotees, individual devotees at the individual level. All these four activities he has been doing from the very beginning, but each phase has its own predominant characteristic, as I had now explained it to you. 
Now, with the 70th birthday, we are entering to the stay into the stage of, and it is also going to be at the turn of the century, practically, which we are closing in, a significant expansion of activities connected with service, selfless, loving, sharing, caring service to the distressed, to the needy, to the oppressed, and to the poor, basically. So we are entering into a new era of Sai service. Free education is one of them. He only shows by his own example, he shows by his own example, takes up certain projects of fundamental importance to the needy in terms of free education, number one, and free medical service, number two, and all related activities concerning free provision of these two services, education and medicine. But third also is for upliftment at the rural level the standard of living of the people, also projects are now underway or under in the pipeline in order to give an occupational uh, bias, as it were, an occupational orientation to the kind of education that the rural people receive so that they are in a position to uh, also take up certain jobs, the job-oriented, occupational. Now, this is only what you could call the worldly type of activities which are now coming into more and more prominence. But Baba, in a fundamental sense, has been operating through the individual psyche. He has seven, his activities of this avatar can be summarized as being sevenfold. What are these? Number one, Akarshana is Sarvajananam, to attract, to draw to himself by his loving miracles. The word miracle is rather hackneyed in this context, in Baba's context. It is, should be properly termed, as in the Sanskrit language, it means splendorous divine deeds. It's not just miracles that happen accidentally or that happen because of certain nature's, uh, once in a while, nature's artifacts. It is something which is deliberate, which mere wishing is fulfilling, mere wish of the divine is fulfilling. There is no time lag between cause and effect here. It is an expression of pure grace and it is natural, as he always told me. It is not something which is acquired, like in the case of a yogi, who has to go through certain spiritual exercises of long duration, including penance, hard penance. So it is not yogic, it is not monushic, it is not human effort, because human effort is the cause of many results. But then there is a big time lag, there is preparation, there is effort, and then, of course, certain expression of the results. So it is, that is at the worldly or human level. It's not that. It's not magic level. Second, it is not the yogic level also, because Swami does not, has not done yoga practices at all. There was no mantra, no tantra, no yantra, no puja or worship, no nothing, if I may use a double negative, to emphasize it is absolutely natural. So therefore, through his loving miracles, he will draw. In Kali Yuga, it is the divine who draws the devotees. In the other yugas, the devotee has to make special efforts to have vision of the Lord. In this yuga, because this is a yuga which is 
greatly of eroded human values, of conflict, of violence, of hatred. It's also a yuga of some physical advancement in physical terms, scientific and technological. But it moves us away from the spiritual heritage and spiritual values. And the divinity descends. The divinity descends to the human level and what you call the divinity, the humanity of the divinity is for restoring, revivifying, or establishing, or reminding of the divinity of humanity. So the humanity of divinity is to emphasize, is to operate at the human level in order to bring out the divinity in humanity. The divine takes a human form that is called divinity in human, uh, the humanity in divinity. The first one is humanity in divinity. That means the divine takes a human form in order to restore the inherent divine characteristics in the human, to elevate the human, as it were, to divine level. <coughs> the descent of the divine for the ascent of the human, because human is the crown of creation. So, what are the seven? <laughs> now you have to. Akarshana is Sarvajananam. To draw Sarva, all people, irrespective of caste, race, language, creed, color. Most universal way of bringing together all his devotees, you might call now at this stage, and quote and unquote, all people. In fact, Swami shares the characteristic with Shiva in terms of his devotees being both good and bad people. Shiva has both angelic people as his devotees as well as also the Rakshasas, or the demonic people. Whereas Vishnu, who is in charge of running the universe, he is very particular that only the angelic, the good people come to him. And he rejects the bad people. And he in fact uses Danda, the Dharma Danda, the weapon. Vishnu avatars use weapons even in order to eliminate any negative unprogressive, unevolutionary influences so that the normal evolution of humanity progresses stepward, up. In the case of Shiva, he makes no distinction between either whoever he is, whoever reaches him, he's going to take care of them. Now Baba attracts them by miracles of love, by miracles of curing, of illnesses of both body mind and intellect. The illness of the intellect is ego. The illness of the mind is its unsteadiness. The illness of the body is well known. Baba cures the illnesses of the body. He is the doctor of all doctors, like Shiva, who is called Prathamodaivyo Bhishaku. He is the supreme, the first doctor in the universe is the avatar of Shiva. He is the doctor of doctors, as Bhagavan had said. The hospital, those who want to go to doctors will go to the hospital, which is at the edge of Prashantanilayam. But those who care for the divine to take care of their illnesses, they don't stop on the way at the hospital. They come straight to the ashram. <coughs> In order to weed, in order to separate those who are inclined to go to doctors in the because they are worldly wise, let them stop at the at the hospital. But those who seek curing from me, the curative 
medicine from me, they will come here and I'll take care of them. So he always made that very clear. He's not associated with the hospital in that sense of the term. But at the same time, he says it's an example for others to establish hospitals which don't charge, especially for the poor people, unconscionable fees which they cannot afford. And therefore, he set an example. But his power is his own. He can cure, and he has cured over the years in my family for three gen four generations, various types of illnesses. Whenever they came, he took, <coughs> he took care of them. By a mere wave of his hand, by looking intensely your eyes, or by letting you touch his feet, or above all, by materializing Vibhuti, the sacred ash, which has tremendous curative powers, divine powers, by mere wave of his hand. Lingas come up. The two articles which are mostly associated with Shiva are Shiva Linga and Shiva Vibhuti. No other divinity in the, Hindu, in the Vedic pantheon is associated as closely with Lingas, the the form, the formless taking a form which is not like a picture, not like a human. Only Shiva has two forms. The form, which is the regular form, with limbs, and the form with no limbs, which is endless, like an ellipsoid, like the egg-shaped, which is symbolic of the universal creative act of the universes. Each universe was coming out of Baba in the form of that primal creative act of Shiva was replayed here every Shivaratri for about 10 years by Bhagavan, by bringing out from his own stomach through narrow gullet, big Shivalingas in which the universe is portrayed or at least the earth and the planetary system is portrayed. I had seen it. <coughs> <coughs> what are called extraordinary miracles of reviving the dead even. He took care, he gave life to my father when he was being put on the floor, when doctors had pronounced him almost dead. And there comes a telegram from Baba to me saying, don't worry, he's going to be. I take care of him. You are going to both come to Prashantanilayam in two months' time. Shocking, but it's a great surprise. After I received the telegram, after about an hour or less than that time, he was in great coma, almost passed away. And the doctors advised me to arrange for funeral arrangements or crematory, cremation arrangements. Can you imagine that? And then this telegram arrives, and then we wait, and then he opens his eyes and smiles at me. It was the most mind-boggling experience that I ever had had. So right here, in my own case, in my father's case, he rescued him from the jaws of death. He revived the dead, as many others tell us about Elsie, Co Elsie Kowan was telling about Mr. Kowan. <coughs> the first and foremost characteristic of Bhagavan Baba is attracting, drawing to himself all people from all parts of the world, from all strata, irrespective of caste, race, culture, creed, nationality, number one. And he does it deliberately by what he calls Gurajifika Nyayam, to show to give a candy first to the child, to draw him to himself. And then he would give what he wants to give while giving in the initial stage what you want, the candies. <coughs> Baba. Could you, just, could you just say that again, the second aspect of Baba? The second aspect is after drawing these people, what does he do? 
Vikarshanai Chidushkrutyan. This is a Sanskritic composition I made for Baba's submission, which he accepted with great grace. So the second aspect is to remove the what you call the evil or bad or sinful, if I may use that expression, although the word sin does not occur in the Vedas. Sin is only selfishness, nothing else. There is no original sin there. <coughs> what you call negative, unprogressive tendencies, he removes them. So that is called removal of that is called vikarshana, means akarshana means attraction, vikarshana means weeding out the evil, bad, and so-called quote and unquote sinful qualities. That is reformation of people. Then, what is the third one? Samskaranayacha tamasikana. Tamasik people are those who are ignorant or who are dull, who are what you call somewhat foolish. Foolishness is only means that they repeat the same kind of mistakes over and over and again. They are lazy, ignorant, foolish. These are called tamasic people. Now, he does what? He activates them. Samskarana. Samskarana means to thoroughly <laughs> oil them, oil them up, re-gear them, and activate them, energize them so that they move from a, a position of inactivity, of sheer inactivity, of indifference, to activity and to involvement. So he energizes them. Now the third is aspect is Sankarshanayacha Rajasikanam. The Rajasik people are the people who are ego oriented, but they are workaholics. They work a lot, but they are selfish. They are driven by their ego sense. But they are not inactive, they are super active also. Those are called the so-called super achievers in the materialist sense of the term. <clears throat> but their achievement is purely for their own selfish aggrandizement. It's not to help others as much as to help themselves and to earn the name, the fame. So these are called the Rajasik people. Now what, what does Sama, Baba do? <coughs> <coughs> Of all the people of this of this character, and most of the people who come here are of this type. If I may say so, people from government, from all walks of life, professions, and so on. <coughs> Apart from the poor, the needy, and the suffering and the distressed, who also come in tremendously large numbers. But this category of people who are crucial also, they're activists, they're dynamic, but it is misapplied dynamism. It is selfish dynamism. And in the long run, they are going to do great damage to themselves more than to anybody else, but also to the others in their uh, aggrandizing uh, characteristics. So therefore, Baba, Sankarshanaya, Samyakarshana, he rechannels their energies. You see, they are already energetic, but he shows other channels in which they are activism will find fullest expression and fullest satisfaction for themselves and for the society. So he makes them social oriented and he gives them projects of service. And not that, he also teaches the values, human values. He makes them into humans from mere being automata of mechanistic activity, which is only for their own aggrandizement. He removes that. He def inflates their ego in the beginning just to give them a sense of importance to which they're accustomed. And he deflates so very quickly that in no time the inflated 
is pricked, his bubble is pricked. And many people I have seen who at the end cried to see what the wrong way they were going. But they were the dynamic people, the active people. So that, that's the third. The fourth aspect is Sankarshanaicha Rajasikanam Utkarshanaicha Sadhunam The Sadhu are the good people, the noble people, the virtuous people, the people whom you don't see pushing around these days. They are being pushed around. The humble, the spiritual, the egoless, the people who have selfless service and who are not aggrandizing at all and who are being pushed back. He elevates them. He gives them higher and higher levels of spiritual experiences. He takes them on, gives them, guides them, raises them to higher and higher levels of spirituality. That's the called Utkarshana. Ut means to elevate. Karshana means to do, to perform an elevating job, elevating them to higher levels of spirituality. Utkarshana. Sadhu Naam, Sadhu they are called. And what is the sixth one? Sakshat Karaycha Bhakta Naam. The sixth category are the Bhaktas, the devotees. You see? And the devotees, what does he do to them? Those who are really already on the path of spirituality, steadfast in their law, in their faith, and who are practicing various types of spiritual disciplines, who come to him. Now he does, ultimately he gives, fulfills their dream. Sakshatkara means he gives the vision of the Lord. They obtain the spiritual vision, the spiritual experience of the highest order, which is the culmination of life's objectives, ultimately. <coughs> so, the general run he attracts. Out of them he takes the people with bad propensities, removes those. And out of those who are a little dull and inactive, he reactivates reactiva them, energizes them. And then for the category which are active, but only for selfish purposes, he rechannels <coughs> their energies. <coughs> the good and humble people, the noble people, the pious people. He gives them, elevates their elevates them by higher and higher levels of spiritual experiences. And lastly, for these people who are his devotees, he raises them to, to he gives, he, he bestows a vision of divinity, which is the final culmination of all spiritual life. And the seventh, Prema Seva Sansthapanaya Sambhavami Pade Pade. This is again, it applies all over on a collective scale to a, the total impact of his with all these activities is Prema Sahita Seva. <coughs> the seventh Prema Seva Samsthapanaya Sambhavami Pade Pade. This is the vow that he has taken also. This is the seventh and the final aspect of his avataric activities is to promote, if not to actually re-establish, selfless, loving service to fellow men. Prema Sahita Seva, it's not mere service. It has no selfishness about it. 
it is purely and wholly altruistic for the good of society as a matter for your own duty not that you are getting something in quid pro quo something in return something to exaggerate your ego that you are doing service no it must be selfless it must be dedicated dedicated to the divine bhagavad arpita nishkama desireless swadharma as duty as your own duty as you would do to take care of your own body it's for your own sake he says it's uh, when we say altruism is not service to others of course you have to do service to others it is in order to elevate yourself that purpose is a noble purpose so therefore he says upakar upa kar he uses the word also upa means upa samipe to get near kar to near divinity so dedicated acts of selfless loving sharing caring service to the needy to the deficient to the distressed to the oppressed to the suppressed to the repressed to the compressed their personality is compressed because they don't have that surroundings properly so he has come to revive this principle to reestablish it like bhagwan sri krishna had said he has come dharma sanstapana arthai sambhavam yuge yuge he said from age to age krishna said i will incarnate to establish the principle of dharma but dharma means using danda dharma danda means the if you in order to establish the whole orderliness anybody who disturbs the order has to be pushed aside has to be even eliminated so krishna used his chakra for his dharma danda as a weapon he used weapons all the vishnu avatars not all the major ones the 10 had used magnum force mega weapons because if they come to disturb the order the evolutionary order it will be anti evolutionary forces are eliminated and annihilated even if necessary but as bhagwan said in kali yuga the rakshasic tendencies are right within each one the bad tendencies are so entrenched within each one one is both a demon and also a human is a compounded of materiality of jadatvam which is inert and compounded of materiality of animality because of past lives of so many he must have taken attachment to the bodies animality and now his humanity and he is also divinity and there is demonity so he is compounded of these five at which time which aspect emerges and dominates him you don't know in this so in order to you don't have to eliminate him if you eliminate him what is the point everybody is to be eliminated then because everybody has these tendencies negative tendencies so therefore in kali yuga you would have to have the transformational reformational revolutionizing of course the word revolutionary i would call it baba would not use those words because they are hackneyed expressions changing reforming transmuting transforming and perhaps even revolutionizing it's what we would call spiritual radical humanism universal universal spiritual radical ultimate analysis it's not in any uh, modern term like that a radical means radically rooting out some of these bad tendencies and at the end humanism at its best that is baba universality humanism and total transformation now these three he stands on that and all his otherwise why should the divine take the limitations of human form the absolute is called the absolute reality the supreme reality is signified by number 9 the absolute reality which is covered with maya or illusory power 
which is of its own making. It's like the cloud which arises and clouds the vision of the sun. It is the sun's energy which produces the cloud. But that cloud veils him from us. It does not really veil the sun. It is his own creation, the cloud. Now, so therefore, the one who is covered with the cloud is called Ishwara, personal God. God. He's, he's eight. Number eight signifies his, the supreme, absolute reality which is untouched, unaffected, f fixed, and unattached. For the sake, it wails, comes up with its illusory power, what you call maik power, in order to undertake this activity of multiplication in the world. He loves himself, so he divides himself. Ekam sat, vipraha bahut avadanti, but also ekoham bahusyam. The one becomes the many in order that he loves the many. So each one of the many must are destined to get back to that one Godhead. So, see, the eighth is already involvement with the, the creation activity. The nine is absolute, the highest, un unaffected, always unaffected. He's always unaffected. But eight means a little one. When you get involved, you're already a little one number down, one number down. And seven is taking on the human garb coming in a form. It limits. It's self-limitation, though. He self-limits. The Absolute limits itself by Maik power, that is eight, the Absolute nine, deliberately limits itself by its, surrounds itself by its Maik energy, that's called eight. And even, even then, he comes down to the level of the human or any other form limits themselves to that form, and then that is seven. So this is the... Pro it's nothing that even the, the incarnation has all powers. And unaffected inside, he's supremely detached within Baba. Or intensely active without, outside. Like Krishna, all avatars has this characteristic. They're intensely, un supremely detached. Nothing affects them. No desire, no attachment, but intensely active in the world outside. That is the secret of an avatar, and that is number seven. Okay, I finished. There are many criteria which have been set, uh, set in the Vedas. <coughs> One is at the cosmic creative level, at the macrocosm. The other is at the level at which we understand and where he can operate to see the same powers being exhibited, but on a micro scale. It's the same thing. But one is at the beginning of creation, during creation, at the macro fullest level. The other is at the, at the level of relative levels, of worldly level. We, when we are around, he is there. Now, the first criteria is utpattincha vinashancha bhutanam agatim gatim vairagya syatamokshasya shannam itibhaya there are six characteristics. Utpattincha <coughs> vinasincha. Creation and destruction. Utpatti vinasha is destruction. Utpattincha vinasincha. Disappearance. Appearance and disappearance. Or creation. Original primal creation is only one. But its appearance and disappearance activity is called utpatti, creation and or projection and disappearance which is called destruction also at the, at the cosmic final dissolution of the universe that's destruction. But at this level it is disappearance. Utpatti 
So he should be able to create things by sheer willing. I have explained this earlier and you can put that here. <coughs> Effortlessly, with no effort at all, by sheer willing is fulfilling. That is the word there. Instantaneous, no time lag. Utpati. Creation, similar disappearance or a dis a destruction. Acts of that. <coughs> Bhutanam agatim gatim. Knowing the past, present and future of living beings. Agati means coming in. Gatim means going out. The comings and goings of means the past, present and future of the world or of his of the living beings. Utpattincha vinashincha bhutanam agatim gatim. Ah. Ah. That's right. That's right. That you give it to me and give. So He is supremely detached, he is unaffected. The great Patanjali had said he is unaffected by anything, no desire of his own, no attachment, no needs even. So, supremely detached, like Krishna was, but intensely active outside, without actual effort. Swami's, the six basic movements of his hand, he told me once, Shanmudra, the whole thing is done like that. Movements of his hand. It's a sign, it's a sign of various... But he said that is not even necessary, he just, what he thinks, has to take place right away, right away. And he knows the past, present and future. How many times he told me what I had done. I had kept in my drawer in New York, in my UN drawer in New York. He described what I had kept there. He described what I had written and kept, what he had given there in the drawer. On the <coughs> 26th floor, you kept that. And he would Anything and everything from he, he transcends time and distance. He created that speaking of Hanuman, the subhuman being who rose, is going to be the next creator. The greatest devotee was Hanuman, the so called monkey god, who was the greatest devotee of Ram. He was describing him in Kodaikanal. <coughs> And he rejected Hanuman at the end of the great uh, Ram Ravan war. They all came back and he was coronated. Ram was coronated. And at the coronation he gave presents to everybody. But he did not give anything to this humble, supplicating monkey who was sitting night by his side. And then Sita, Mother Sita tells Ram, why is it you are not giving anything to the most devoted of all the, of all those around him? Why has he? And he makes signs, and you must see how Swami signs, so he makes those signs like Ram did. You can give if you want. They were sitting on the on that throne, in the full assembly, of an emperor, and there is no talk. Only the, through gestures of the eyes, through movements of eyes. He delicately tells her, if you want, you can give. And then she takes what Ram had given her at her marriage, that pearl necklace, she takes it out and gives it to. But Hanuman is not to be fascinated by the worldly things. He says, what use is this? The finest pearls coming from that? So he puts the pearl to his ear to see if it reverberates with the name of God. Naturally, it doesn't. And then he tries to bite 
and break them and to see if the name is written of Ram. The divine name is included there. And he therefore finds nothing, he throws it. He is not fascinated by the artifacts of nature. He is not fascinated, he said, attracted by creation. He is only attracted by the creator. Through creation, you must use your brains to see the cause of such grief, the primal cause, the cause of all causes. So your mind must move from creation to the creator. That is why the creation is meant. <coughs> he throws it away and his... And others make fun of him. What is it? He's like a monkey you're throwing away things, valuable things. He said, no. He said, Ram, I want Ram everywhere. Yes. He, he showed, do you have Ram in your, this thing, in your heart or in your body? Yes. He tears open his heart and there is Ram installed in his heart. And Swami at that time created exactly that same pearl necklace, that same pearl necklace. In a flash it came to all of us who are there, who are very few of us, about 30, 40 people. Emphasizing that he was not fascinated with this creation. He was only concerned with the creator. And that is his level of spirituality. And then what happened? He was, he was mentioning the lesson even before that he was not fascinated with, Hanuman was not fascinated with creation but only with the Creator only. That was his, his, no, his attention was only always on that, not on this. Well, he said, that is why he was great. But when Swami had created this one, transcending time and place, this took place about half a million years ago, in Ayodhya, which is about 1600 kilometers from here. So he transcended time and place and brought that same article we all forgot what Swami said and we all fell head over heels, not on Swami's feet or not looking at Him, but only on this created object. <laughs> How great it is! Oh my God! We were saying, my God to the created object when the God who created it is right there. And we were grabbing, we were, He was showing it to us, of course. He said, Subarao, do you see even the teeth marks on it? I saw teeth marks. I counted them. There are 108 pearls. Beautiful ashy white pearls. Big ones, 108. Ha! Like that. And then he said, Disubara, you also see an imprint of the picture of Hanuman. He was so intensely looking at it. But it is like the, uh, the shroud of Christ. Which is <coughs> print. I did see that on some of them, the picture of Hanuman who is intensely gazing and his gaze is so strong that his whole personality is expressed through that gaze and got imprinted on that. My God! So I was just telling you, he said to all of us at the end, you are all falling head over heels to see and to admire only that. But Hanuman was not like that. He was not fascinated with these nature's artifacts. That is only a means for you. The body is only a means. You're not the body. It's the spirit. And go, go deeper and deeper into the inner quest of things also. Who am I? Am I the body? No. This is what's right. So he can teach the greatest. That's a jnanam. That's also one characteristic of the, of undifferentiated, non-dualistic, Jnana, in the Upanishadic sense, he must be able to expound. Avatars have 16 powers of attraction, and these 16 powers are mentioned in the Vedas. And greatest Vedic scholar of contemporary time who lived here with Bhava has come to recognize through various Vedic criteria, the application of Vedic criteria of recognizing of an avatar 
he came to the conclusion that Baba fulfills every one of the 16 characteristics. And that, of course, was also the seer or the revealer of uh, Sach Sai Gayatri. Gayatri is a mantra, the holiest mantra, dedicated to divinities only. And the last Gayatri that we heard in this great land of Bharat was the Gayatri dedicated to Krishna 5,200 years ago. After that, there was no revelation of any Gayatri for any other personality in the land of sages in this land of seers and that took place that revelation took place in 1977 when the Satsai Gayatri emerged automatically spontaneously by the touch of the hand of Baba on this great scholar's head and who in the middle of his speech stopped and Baba said go ahead and say it and it came out spontaneously out of his of the Vedic mouth of a great Vedic scholar, Vedic India. Um, what is that? I want to say. Vedic India has paid the greatest tribute to Baba. Ah, that's right. Through the revelation of Sat Sai Gayatri, which reads, only an avatar can inspire the spontaneous outburst of a mantra equivalent to the Vedic Gayatris. And that is Om Sai Shwaraya Vidmahe Satya Devaya Dhimahi Tanna Sarva Prachodayat That mantra means we realize through our spiritual texts, we realize through the word of the selfless preceptors, gurus, and we realize above all by our own direct experience that this Sai is divinity incarnate. That is the first part of the statement. After recognizing our understanding that this Sai is divine, fully divine, what do we do? We meditate on this God of truth, Satya Devaya Dhimahi. We meditate on this God of truth with faith and trust. And what do we do after adoration? Then after meditation, what do we do with a mantra? You pray. You pray for yourself in a spiritual sense of the term, not for selfish purposes. We earnestly pray, Satya Devaya Dhimahi. The third part of the eight-lettered part. We earnestly pray to that all-in-all -all divinity, Sarvaha. Sarvaha means all-in-all. All. The all which is in every one of us. The all of us. That divinity, the Atmic consciousness here, the Brahmic consciousness is, is invoked. We earnestly pray to that all-in-all all divinity, to inspire us, to guide us, to direct us, to lead us on the liberating path of truth, right action, peace, love, non-violence, and above all, of service and sacrifice. That is the sum and substance of this mantra, which arose 18 years ago. In Brindavan holy time, Christmas Eve in Brindavan, I wrote an article on this. Holy time, Christmas Eve. Holy place, Brandavan, the residence of Bhagavan Baba. Holy presence, divine presence, right in the presence of Bhagavan Baba, right under his own inspiration, as it, which took place right in the front of our eyes. Holy time, holy place, holy mantra, holy personality. The one who revealed it was the greatest living Vedic scholar at that time of India. And uh, he was the authentic interpreter of Vedas, who was the last of the line, as Swami had said. In Kali Yuga, Vedas, the knowledge of Vedas declines. But Baba is there to spread the wisdom of the Vedas. So it is through the mouth of a holy 
Vedic personality, credibility is there, inspiration is there, divine inspiration, holy presence is there, holy time, holy place, holy mantra and holy divinity dedicated to this holy contemporary avatar of the age. So therefore that's the power. Now this reverberates all through the world now. This Satsai Gayatri Mantra, unless it has that power, how come you go to Timbuktu even now? There are places I've been all over South, in South America or North America or in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in every village practically of India. Now it has spread, the Satsai Gayatri Mantra, because it is Satsai who gives the power to that mantra. And this is the most, the mantra of the modern age, dedicated to the living God. Living God means it has more radiation, more power, more directness. Of course, all other phenomena are there. God is everywhere and God is only one. But sages call it by different names. And God is everywhere. But we concentrate on one point in order to get the benefit out of that concentrated sunshine, as it were. So, now, with respect to this, uh, the sevenfold mission or vision of Bhagavan Baba, the contemporary avatar, it is put in these terms. It says, I incarnate again and again for firmly establishing through my own example the practice of selfless loving service amongst all people, says Baba. And in order to, that is the main purpose, in order to do what? Prema Seva Sansthapanaya Sambhavami Pade Pade. That is the seventh I read first. The first one is Akarshanai Sarvajananam to attract, to draw and fascinate everyone by miracles of love, of selfless service, of miracles of curing, miracles of teaching, extraordinary superhuman miracles of inner transformations. The second, Vikarshanai Chidushkruta Dushkrutyam, to weed out the bad qualities of evil doers. The third, Sankarshanai Tamasikanam, reform and activate the inactive and ignorant people. Samskaranai Tamasikanam, reform and activate the inactive and ignorant people. That's the third. Sankarshanai Charajasikanam, the fourth one is to transform the ego-centered and passionate people. The fifth, Utkarshanai Sadhunam, elevate the good and the noble souls to higher spiritual realms. Sakshat Karshanai Chabhaktanam. The sixth one, to bestow on sincere devotees a direct vision of divinity a direct vision of divinity. And the seventh one, which I read earlier, is to incarnate, and the purpose of incarnation as a finale, the seventh purpose is a, to appear again and again for firmly establishing, through my own example, the practice of selfless, loving service amongst all people. Universalism, love, selfless, loving service, that is the Raizandath of this great avataric incarnation. This is an extraordinary picture materialized by Bhagavan Satsai Baba to my father three decades ago. My father was a great Vedic scholar. And when in he was speaking, he was comparing Baba with some of the Vedic personalities of, of divinities. Of Nazism, but he forgot to mention about wars. Shiva in his talk. Swami the next day took us round the mandir and in my presence materialized 
this then it particular is picture about 300 million and gave it to my father saying shastri ji so the this is my true form so this is the true form given as mentioned by baba